really the interest is huge, which is I think very good. Also for you, uh, for, for, for the democratic uh, developments in Russia. And uh, uh, to, uh, later today we will have a great debate uh, with a uh, member of the European Parliament, Sandra Kalnit, and also the uh, experts and uh, civil society activists on, on, on uh, what's, uh, what's happening uh, in, in Russia. How can Latvia, how can Europe help uh, us? But uh, what was very important for us when we prepared this visit uh, was that uh, Mr. Ashurkov meets young people because the young people will, uh, will shape uh, the, the future of the world. And, and, and uh, young people should understand what is happening in, in, uh, in Russia. So uh, also thank you to Sigita for, for organizing this uh, event uh, with, uh, with young people. And uh, the main reason of the visit is that the last uh, year, end of the last year, the European Parliament awarded its uh, Sakharov Prize uh, to the Russian uh, uh, oppositioner, uh, Alexei Navalny. And taking into account uh, that, that uh, Russia is next to our borders, it was very important for us uh, to continue uh, debate uh, on, on this uh, Sakharov's uh, uh, Prize Laureate's uh, uh, agenda here, uh, here in Latvia. And uh, we are happy that uh, Mr. Ashurkov accepted our invitation uh, to, to come on behalf of the uh, Mr. Navalny's team uh, to Latvia and to speak about that. Uh, about the Sakharov Prize, maybe a, sh uh, a couple of words. It, uh, it was established uh, already uh, 30 years ago and then it's named after Soviet uh, physicist and political dissident uh, Andrei Sakharov. And while well, coming from this region, I think he would be ha very happy to see that uh, especially the last two years, uh, laureates uh, are from this region, uh, Mr. Navalny and also a year before uh, the Russian opposition. Uh, so the, the prize, uh, apart from its uh, financial uh, side, which is also uh, quite serious, it's, uh, 50,000 euros which are awarded to the L'Oreal, uh, but also helps the L'Oreal to implement uh, its, its, its activities to fight for the freedom of thought. Uh, it also uh, turns world's attention to the L'Oreal's uh, cause and also to the uh, issue of the problems with the freedom of the thought. But coming to the topic, and I really uh, look forward to a very interesting uh, discussion today with the, uh, the young people here. Uh, but uh, coming, uh, coming from the European Parliament, I would, I would like to, to emphasize that the European Parliament has uh, several times emphasized and also at the end of the last year has, uh, has stressed that because of its aggression, Russia should pay uh, serious economic and a political uh, uh, price. So um, today, today, later on, uh, I really suggest you to join also the discussion with Mr. Ashurko and, and uh, uh, European decision uh, makers about uh, how, how it can happen, uh, how, how Europe can, uh, can help Russia to, to, on its road to the uh, democracy. But now really I give floor to you and look, uh, looking forward to, uh, to hear what are young people interested in, 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 in Russian issues and uh, what do you have to say to Russian uh, uh, to, to, to Thank you, Marta. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome you, you all uh, to this special lecture organized by Latvian Transatlantic Organization in cooperation with the European Parliament Bureau uh, and Faculty of Social Science of the University of Latvia. We are pleased to host uh, this lecture given by uh, our very special guest, Vladimir Ashokov who is a uh, Russian opposition politico, uh, politician currently living in London. Uh, and Mr. Ashurkov, thank you very much for uh, being with us here today uh, and uh, uh, willing to share your ideas with our youth. Uh, and it is uh, our honor to host you here today. And uh, in uh, 2011, uh, Mr. Ashurkov, co-funded anti-corruption uh, fund and non-profit organization together with Alexei Navalny, uh, the leader of uh, Russian opposition movement and I would say uh, uh, the symbol of uh, peaceful uh, opposition uh, in Russia. And in 2014, as a result of politically motivated uh, prosecutions, 
by the Russian authorities, Mr. Ashurkov uh, was uh, forced to move to London and in 2015 he received political asylum uh, in there. Uh, but Mr. Ashurkov continued his civic and political work, which is very important, especially nowadays when uh, Mr. Navalny is imprisoned. Um, uh, and that's why we really believe that, that this uh, uh, work, which is being continued, is especially important signal, not only for uh, Russian position in, in Russia or Russian people, but also for us here in Latvia and uh, people in Europe in general. Um, it really demonstrates that there is political will for changes and I believe today students will also ask about this future uh, and uh, possibility of changes in, in Russia um, and uh, here today uh, the, in another side of camera unfortunately not in person because of COVID restrictions there are stu uh, students of Bachelor Program of Political Science of the University of Latvia. As well, there are students from Communication Science, Sociology, and we believe that there is wider public as well who can join us in uh, Facebook uh, streaming. Uh, but now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Ashurkov to give his lecture. But before we will see video, uh, which is uh, dedicated to the Sakharov of Christ. Alexei Navalny, a leading opposition figure in Russian politics, has been awarded the 2021 Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought for his fight for democracy in Russia. Navalny has spent years exposing corruption among Russia's top officials and leading demonstrations against the regime. His actions struck a chord with millions of people across the country. Since becoming a household name, he's been arrested, harassed and poisoned in an apparent attempt on his life. In February, he was imprisoned in a penal colony. Come una volta lui stesso ha affermato la corruzione prospera quando manca il rispetto dei diritti umani. E io credo che abbia ragione. La lotta alla corruzione è una lotta per il rispetto dei diritti umani universali. Ed è certamente una lotta per la dignità umana, per il buon governo e per lo stato di diritto. Navalny's daughter, Daria, collected the prize on behalf of her father, delivering his message to the European Parliament. When I wrote to my dad and asked, what exactly do you want me to say in the speech from your uh, point, he answered, say that no one can dare to equate Russia to Putin's regime. Russia is a part of Europe, and we strive to become a part of it. The European Parliament has condemned the arrest, attempted assassination and imprisonment of Alexei Navalny. It's calling for his immediate release. By awarding him the 2021 Sakharov Prize, MEPs recognize his fight for democracy and fundamental freedoms in his native Russia. It's an honor for me to be here. Good morning. Um, as uh, Marty said, I'm here on invitation of European Parliament's uh, mission in uh, Latvia. And uh, uh, it's a great opportunity for me to speak uh, to young people about what's happening in Russia, about what, uh, how the movement of Alexei Navalny, the most important political movement uh, over the last decade in Russia, evolved. And uh, I'm glad to speak to young people because change in life, change in politics is really uh, brought by young people and we'll, uh, we'll see it in my presentation. Um, a few words about myself. I was born in Moscow. Uh, I got technical education in Russia and then a uh, business degree uh, in the United States. Uh, I returned to Russia after the studies in 1996. Uh, I worked in finance, I worked in transportation, 
2006 to 2012, I worked for Alpha Group, which is one of the largest uh, investment companies uh, in Russia in a uh, senior executive capacity. And uh, in, I was always interested in uh, politics and government, but I never was a member of any political party uh, or participated in politics. And in 2009, I started reading a blog of a young anti-corruption campaigner, uh, campaigner Alexei Navalny. I wrote to him, I told him, well, I have experience in finance, in corporate governance, uh, I like what you're doing, so let me start helping you in spare time. Uh, so I started doing that, and uh, one thing led to another, our uh, work uh, and recognition grew. So in 2012, I had to leave my corporate job, uh, and I focused on civil and uh, political work uh, uh, in uh, Alexei Navalny's team. In 2014, uh, a criminal case was opened against me, so I had to leave Russia, and for the last eight years, I have been living with my family in uh, London. Um, within our, our team with uh, Navalny, my main areas of focus of responsibility is strategy, formulating our economic political program, uh, fundraising, uh, both talking to different donors and creating the infrastructure for raising funds for what we do and relations with uh, opinion leaders, economists, business people, uh, writers, actors, and, and Western media. <coughs> so what is happening in Russia in political terms? Uh, it's a very repressive political environment and uh, the level of repression increased over the last uh, 15 uh, years. The corruption uh, has really become the, the backbone of how Russia is governed, it's political and economic corruption, so uh, a regional, I'll give you an example, a regional governor um, uh, uses funds that the central government uh, sends to, to his region for repair of roads, he uses it to enrich him and his business cronies, and at the same time the central government expects that he will put pressure uh, and on the election date, it, uh, the, the uh, results in his region will be in the favor of uh, part of power. So there is uh, widespread vote rigging uh, in favor of the ruling political party, United Russia and its candidates. Um, the system of registration of parties and of candidates for elections is very cumbersome and uh, uh, it's quite difficult to uh, get uh, the required number of, cities, uh, of, of signatures to be registered, but also even if you get them, the Electoral Commission often denies registration to independent candidates. Uh, there are restrictions on financing uh, for independent parties, uh, for candidates uh, and for charities, and uh, the party of power and its candidates receive full support from uh, the state. Um, non-profit organization, which is a, an integral part of civil society, uh, it's quite difficult to register and the reporting requirements are, are uh, very strict. In addition, uh, recently a law on foreign agents uh, was introduced, so if a non-profit organization that's doing civil work uh, receives money from abroad, uh, it is designated as a um, foreign agent. Um, and uh, the state media launch smear campaigns against independent non-profit groups, activists, uh, in particular those involved in political uh, activities and, and human rights. Um, law enforcement agencies and court system is used to put pressure uh, on activists. Um, people are detained uh, for uh, really peaceful activities, for participation in mass protests, uh, for posting uh, things online. And uh, most tragically, uh, there is a history of assassinations of opposition politicians and journalists. Um, in 2015, one of the most prominent Russian opposition politicians, Boris Nemtsov, was uh, uh, murdered. Uh, there have been a number of uh, assassinations and 
the, the latest in 2012, the poisoning of Alexei Navalny that uh, almost ended uh, in his death. State uh, is controlling the information that uh, white population receives um, in terms of mass media. The, the national TV channels are controlled by uh, the state and uh, they are portraying uh, the, the government as uh, good and the people who dissent as bad. Uh, and uh, recently with the increased aggressiveness in Russia in foreign policy, it also um, portrays Russia as a besieged uh, fortress surrounded by hostile uh, states, uh, NATO, European Union, etc. Um, and uh, it's very difficult for opposition politicians and civil activists to, to access state-controlled media. You just cannot get uh, on, uh, on TV or in major newspapers. It's uh, really um, sometimes bizarre. So, for instance, Vladimir Putin, he often is asked about Alexei Navalny in interviews. He never uh, says his name and, and he says that person uh, or, or something uh, similar. Um, so the challenges that civil and political activists have to face is really monopoly in political life. Uh, since it has been going for a number of years, most people uh, in Russian society are disillusioned with any civil and political uh, efforts uh, and they are increasingly afraid to participate in this because of fear of uh, persecution um, and there is a certain sense of apathy uh, in big parts of Russian society. It's difficult to get funding to do politics, to do civil activism. You cannot do it without uh, fundraising and the government does everything to um, preclude people uh, from contributing to political causes. Uh, and people are uh, very reliant on the state. They expect state to give them uh, you know, money and uh, different benefits. So this paternalistic attitudes dating back to Soviet times also hinder the development of independent politics and uh, civil society. And <clears throat> This is not a good background to be a politician and civil activist. But Alexei Navalny created an organization and became the most prominent opposition politician over the last 15 years. Um, he uh, it was also born uh, in Moscow. He received legal education. Uh, he was from early years, from his 20s, uh, interested in political and civil activism. Um, he is the most prominent opposition politician and now I must say that he is worldwide the most prominent, the most famous political prisoner. He became the most popular uh, political blogger. blogger. So um, he, his big first fame came from his investigation of corruption in large Russian state-controlled companies. Gazprom, Transneft, the bank VTB, and um, um, I started working with him in that time, in 2010, and we always, under we always understood that fighting corruption in Russia, it seems like a civil activity, uh, not political, but in Russia, since corruption permits everything, um, fighting corruption is really fighting the, the political regime and uh, Vladimir Putin. Um, in 2011, his campaign um, and his slogan, United Russia is a party of crooks and thieves, uh, gained a big recognition in, in the run-up to the parliamentary elections in December of 2011, and uh, uh, the polls say that uh, this campaign resulted in the uh, United Russia uh, getting uh, less than 10%, 10% less than expected result in the elections. He received a number of awards. One of them is that he's one of top 100 most influential people in the world uh, by Time Magazine in 2012. 
um, he is he has been uh, obviously he's in jail now he was poisoned but he was under repression for most of his political life um, in 2013 he um, was sentenced first to five years and then this sentence become suspended uh, for uh, on falsified charges of economic crimes um, his brother who is not involved in politics um, he served three and a half years in prison on politically motivated charges basically he was a hostage uh, held by Russian state uh, to influence Alexei Navalny um, the, his assassination in 2020 was not the first attack on him uh, he was attacked in 2017 with some green acid that an attack occurred in his eye and he almost lost eyesight in one eye and during his presidential campaign in 2017 out of 365 days in that year he spent one-fifth in um, detention on various um, uh, offenses so what do we do? How uh, do people who want to change Russia think about their strategy in this environment? Um, we understand that the democratic forces in Russia are not strong enough to confront the authorities heads on. Um, and um, the political field has been bulldozed by the authorities for years. Uh, our opponents who are in power have unlimited financial resources, they have all the levers of administrative power, they are not afraid to use police and courts to suppress opposition. So uh, our goal is to create an organization that will be um, the most powerful political force in Russia when the system starts to change, uh, when a political crisis happens and that's inevitable with how Russia is run these days um, and the aspects of the strategy is obviously increasing public recognition uh, without access to mainstream media we have to use uh, internet creatively and word of mouth uh, so that people know what who we are who the leaders of the movement are what do we stand for increasing support base through various campaigns, um, mailings, uh, different events that we do online and offline, building the organization. Our movement has millions of supporters in Russia, but there's core team that work full time on our civil and political uh, projects um, and building this organization. When I, when I started working with Navalny in 2010, he just had his small corporate law practice with maybe five people and um, when at the, at the peak of our organization when it was yet not banned um, in 2020 it was over 200 people uh, throughout Russia um, we have to be flexible and nimble under these repressive conditions I, we, we use the term we're playing on different chessboards because authorities are always uh, putting pressure on us. So we use different uh, types of uh, activities, uh, anti-corruption investigations. We have to, in absence of uh, access to mainstream media, we need to be, become a media outlet ourselves. And uh, uh, our, the blog and the, video, the, the YouTube channel uh, routinely get millions of uh, views for the content that we put up. Um, it's important to offer an attractive alternative. Yes, Russia as it's run by Putin is bad. The, the standards of living uh, are not increasing, there is no rule of law, but how we will propose to, to, to do it better. So we had uh, uh, worked out a, a political program, economic program in um, 
cooperation with the leading Russian economists and political scientists. And um, very important is uh, maintaining and strengthening moral authority. So our opponents are corrupt, ruthless, and uh, uh, they, they don't have any regard to justice and to the population. We are strong, principled, not afraid to face pressure, transparent, and that has been exemplified more, more strongly by Alexei Navalny, but also by other members of our team. Um, a few words about different aspects of what we do. So anti-corruption investigations, we investigate uh, state-owned companies where uh, billions of dollars are stolen every year. We investigate officials um, and uh, we try to do it in an entertaining way. We don't just publish reports, we try to put it into um, uh, videos, uh, usually, uh, sometimes long, often hour, m in many cases uh, shorter, and uh, we found that um, people in the internet, young people, they engage more, um, they engage better with video content, so th this is a poster of our, one of our investigations uh, about uh, Attorney General whose um, sons amassed a big business empire using favors from the state authorities. We create instruments for people to be more active uh, throughout our history. The first one was Rospil, which is sort of Russian saw. It's a um, metaphor for stealing or, or sowing of uh, money and assets from uh, the state. Um, uh, so it was in, in Russia there was a law introduced that uh, all government purchases, all government procurement had to be done uh, online through tenders and we collected a team of lawyers who would receive tips from population and would look at this announcement of tenders and would look at who participates in them and try to uh, identify which tenders are rigged, which are flawed, which are probably corrupt and we would file complaints with different authorities and uh, although um, it's difficult to fight corruption in Russia, we had success and over two billion of dollars of cancelled um, corrupt uh, purchases by the government. A couple of other, a few other uh, projects, Rosyama, which help people uh, deal with municipal authorities uh, on issues of road uh, quality. Uh, Ros issues with the communal services. So, if the temperature of hot water in your apartment is below standard and it has been like this always, what do you do? And we created a simple online form that you could uh, fill in and it would post uh, the complaints to relevant uh, government authorities. Ross Wilbury, which was monitoring the elections and smart voting, which is a system of identifying which candidates in the elections uh, have, are, are most likely to win against the party of power, the candidates from the uh, authorities, and uh, to uh, consolidate the votes of independent people uh, behind these candidates. Media, we had to become a uh, media and a um, uh, media empire basically uh, because it's what we do is, is uh, one of the most significant content providers in, uh, you know, in, in Russian internet. It's the blog, it's newspapers during electoral campaigns, uh, one of them was called Popular Politics, it's weekly newsletter for our supporters. It's our Navalny Life uh, YouTube channel. Um, I think it's over six million subscribers now at, uh, at this channel. Vision of the future. Um, we put out uh, different intellectual programs. Just to give you a summary, our basic premise is Russia is a European country, it belongs to Europe uh, historically, culturally, even religiously. Uh, it's, it would be natural for Russia to uh, be uh, on a path 
to European values, uh, representative political system, fair, um, fair court system, free mass media. So this is a cover of one of our uh, political uh, programs. Uh, political activity. Yes, it's difficult for independent candidates to participate in elections. Our party, we tried to register our party for years and always we were denied registration by the authorities. But uh, elections are still a point of pressure against the authorities and uh, we use it to um, campaign, uh, to increase our recognition to um, increase the number of supporters, to show people that it's possible to fight this repressive uh, regime. So, um, since we, uh, uh, since most of our activities has to be done on the internet, uh, inevitably the cat from internet memes makes its way into the presentation and I want to uh, talk to you in more detail about a particular campaign, the mayoral campaign in 2013, uh, where Alexei Navalny uh, ran as a mayor. Um, it, it happened eight years ago, eight and a half years ago. Um, so since then, a lot of things happened. Alexei Navalny uh, had a presidential campaign that was longer and maybe more prominent. I wanted to focus on this because well, at that time, in 2013, I was still in Moscow, so I witnessed this all with uh, my own eyes, and at that time, the political environment was not that repressive. So we were able to, um, to, to do our campaign with limited um, obstacles from the authorities, and the, the how we did it, uh, I think it uh, has lessons not only for authoritative countries like Russia, but for politicians and activists uh, throughout the world. So it's um, summer of 2013, and unexpectedly, um, in mayoral elections in Moscow, the capital of Russia, the most important city in the country, uh, are called for September 2013. Um, it was a complete surprise for everyone. Uh, there was a mayor, Sergei Sabanian, that was already uh, in his position at that time. And uh, uh, he uh, announced these elections uh, in, uh, with approval from federal authorities to solidify his support, to increase his legitimacy, uh, because he didn't think that anybody would be able to challenge him. The elections uh, were announced in June. We decided to start the campaign in the beginning of July. So the election were on September 8th. So we had 10 weeks to run a full-fledged electoral uh, campaign. Um, this is our first campaign headquarters. Um, and uh, we started with uh, uh, zero money for a campaign in a city of 10 million people. We started with a staff of eight people. So you see the look on Alexei Navalny's face in these pictures is really puzzled because how can you run any effective campaign with l these limited resources? <clears throat> so if, just to give you a context of what, uh, what we were facing, um, 10 weeks till election day, the ratings of Navalny at that time were uh, around 5%, so nobody really believed that he could achieve anything against the mayor of a city with a budget of billions of dollars, with all media support um, and with uh, all support from um, uh, the law enforcement. Um, we had to raise substantial money to put up the campaign. Any political campaign is costly. It's leaflets, you need to pay small money but still pay uh, volunteers. Um, and at the same time, uh, there was a pending court case against Navalny. Um, 
on economic crimes. So it was unclear whether he would be able to run or he will be really in jail in the middle of this uh, campaign. So we decided to do it. <clears throat> um, and uh, our aims were to obtain the best electoral results, um, to spread the ideas of transparent government and anti-corruption fighting, something that was the, really the theme of all our activities and to show the public that it's possible to run an independent electoral campaign uh, in an effective manner. We were able to, sh to raise about 4 million euro throughout in this two months. Um, we had a wide range of uh, donors uh, and uh, the, the oldest was a babushka uh, of uh, 89 years. We, our campaign was quite innovative, so um, at least for Russia. So in true American style with many meetings and rallies in support of the candidate, we organized 90 meetings in different parts of Moscow for our candidate where uh, 40,000 people attended this meeting. So it was three or four meetings a day um, and uh, it was quite brutal for Alexei and our team. Um, we invented uh, this campaign um, booths or we call them cubes. It's basically a simple cube with uh, posters. You see them on, on the, uh, in the picture uh, with posters that contain information about Navalny, that uh, contain parts of our program, and our volunteers would be standing at these cubes. They would be very recognizable near subway stations, in near uh, big uh, shopping centers, and they would talk to people um, and um, uh, about Navalny and about the elections and about what this means for the future of Russia. And uh, we were able to get 8,000 volunteers who helped us in this campaign. Um, the banners, we were banned from putting billboards, we were banned from advertising on TV. So we said, well, we'll print uh, banners that people can just hang from their balconies with uh, Navalny's name and uh, picture. And uh, um, 1,200 of these banners were distributed. Uh, and people put them on the balconies uh, in Moscow. Um, we used a number of internet tools. So this is, um, uh, this tool was called Navalny v Kajvi Dom, um, where we mapped all the buildings in Russia and our supporters, they gave us information where they live and we, our team, uh, was able to communicate to them and to give them uh, different assignments. Let's say pick up leaflets, put them in all mailboxes in your apartment block. And this shows uh, the, the screen of the monitoring system uh, that we did. 36,000 people from 18 apartment buildings participated in this. We used social networks, the most famous, the most um, popular social network in Russia is not Facebook, uh, it's uh, Fantastic. And um, we used it to, so people could engage with uh, uh, Moscow population and send messages and talk to them about election. Do you know that elections of mayor are happening? What do you think? Uh, do you know who is running? This is a candidate, this is what he stands for, etc., etc. So over 500,000 interactions and engagements uh, through social networks happened during this uh, campaign. Um, we needed support of everybody and, and uh, we had a special program uh, where we reached out to opinion leaders, to scientists, actors, writers, um, uh, musicians and they would give us quotes in support of Navalny who represents the movement of democracy, who represents the movement to new uh, just Russia and we would put them through our social networks and through our 
campaign materials. Um, so we started with ratings 5% and it, it was 10% in the beginning of July with uh, Mayor Sebastian at 77, 78%. And at the end, on the, at the elections, the results were 27% for uh, the independent candidate and 51% for uh, the mayor. We believe that even though these elections were more fair than other elections happening in Russia, there still was some vote reading um, through different mechanisms. So in reality, uh, Navalny have won less than 50% and there should have been a second tour, the, the runoff elections with just these uh, two candidates. Uh, but that's what happened. It was a, a really tremendous result for independent candidate in our campaign. Uh, there were six people running, and Navalny um, got more votes, 27%, than the other four candidates from these parties, which, and these parties, they are present in the parliament, they, uh, they have government support, they existed for years, and uh, an independent candidate without his own party running on an anti-corruption campaign was able to beat them all together. So what are the universal takeaways, not just for Russia, not just for the former Soviet Union, but for everybody? I think any leader, any activist should look for the true motivation inside themselves and if you have it uh, and if you have talent it really shows and you can attract a lot of uh, support um, to your cause. People in, uh, in Western countries uh, please don't take your democratic freedoms for granted. They don't exist in most of the world. Uh, the values that uh, I talked about, a representative political system where people trust the elections and the whole political process, the independent courts, uh, the free mass media, um, many places like Russia, um, which uh, borders Latvia, Latvia. So please value and cherish them. Business skills are universal, so our campaign was really uh, benefiting from many young managers uh, who had business background and were able to uh, organize in short period of time big um, uh, initiatives. Uh, and new technology tools, uh, internet enabled, make um, civil and political campaigns much more cheaper, much more accessible, and much more effective today. So we talked about events of eight years ago. What was happening since then? So in 2014, the um, situation in Russia took a turn to the worse. Russia annexed Crimea. Russia started meddling in eastern Ukraine. Ukraine, supporting separatists, sending army uh, to um, Ukraine. Um, I think the, the most visible event for the for the world was when a Malaysian airliner was shot down over um, rebel-controlled territories. Uh, Navalny was put under house arrest because authorities were. Uh, afraid that uh, in this unstable political situation with increased tension he would be um, an effective organizer because uh, you know the sanctions started and the, the ruble depreciated almost uh, by uh, over 50% so it was a difficult time. Um, in 2017, we published uh, a major investigation into Dmitry Medvedev, who served previously as a president, who was a prime minister at that time, into a property empire that he built and controlled, uh, and uh, which it's, it's a staggering 
its evaluation is a staggering uh, 500 million uh, of euros with 10 palaces built in different parts of Russia. And after that, a campaign of mass protest started under the slogan uh, On Nam Nidimon. Um, and we were also in the middle of organizing it, this. Um, during this campaign, uh, mass protest happened in, hundred, in over 100 cities and towns in Russia with uh, at the peak over 200,000 people participating in this protest. It, it, before that, it only happened in the 90s when uh, Soviet Union was uh, falling and there was a big democratic movement. Um, in December 2016, uh, Navalny launches presidential campaign in anticipation of elections in March of 2018. So a year full proper presidential campaign um, uh, which happens over substantial period of time uh, one year at, at that time uh, because of his conviction he was prohibited uh, to run in this campaign um, so we were uncertain on whether he would be actually able to run to be on the ballot box people could vote for him but we decided to do it anyway um, and uh, hope that um, the pressure of this campaign will force the authorities to let him run. It didn't happen, but it really changed politics. It was the most talked about event over the course of 2017. And then um, in 2018 2000, through 2021, based on the results of this campaign, where we created a network of regional offices in over 40 uh, cities of Russia. We uh, maintained these regional campaign offices, which were doing local political work, which were involved in smart voting. Uh, it's a system where, when you cannot get your own people on the ballot, so that people can vote for them, let's select the people who get on the ballot and who would be the most difficult for the authorities and let's, uh, let's uh, campaign for all our supporters to vote for them. And it has been uh, very effective in a number of regional elections. Um, August 2020 come and Alexei Navalny is poisoned by a chemical weapon on his trip to Siberia. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later um, and um, in 2021 our organization anti-corruption foundation which really was the organizational platform for all our civil and uh, political activities was designated an, an, as extremist and uh, terrorist so we always advocated peaceful protests what we did was civil work investigations media activities participation in uh, elections and political life never any um, appeal to violence and we were put on the same levels as terrorists or as the uh, Taliban uh, for instance um, we now see Russia is increasing the aggressiveness at, at its foreign policy it amassed over 100,000 soldiers on Ukraine border it's a major international crisis that has implications for Europe, for Latvia. The world leaders are trying to prevent this pending aggression. They are talking to Putin. So Russia, my country, is again in the headlines of all world news agencies, unfortunately, in the negative light. A few words in more detail about Navalny's poisoning and situation now. So, uh, on a trip to one of our regional offices, um, he was poisoned by what later appeared to be a chemical agent that was first that first appeared in public domain. Um, after assassinations in in the UK of Skripal's 
former Russian uh, intelligence uh, officer. Um, and uh, he collapsed uh, when he was on a flight back to Moscow. The flight makes an emergency landing. He is put into a hospital. He's put into a coma. Uh, his life is in danger. Nobody understands what's happening because it's a poison that is hard to detect. Um, in the hospital, he's surrounded by security services that don't let uh, his wife and his uh, people who were with him to visit him. The, uh, our team and his wife understands that it's, it's impossible to get um, good and adequate medical care in Russia when the most likely result of his uh, condition is poisoning by the authorities. So, the, and the authorities delay his medical evacuation for a few days. Um, it's widely believed be, because they wanted the poison to uh, get out of his body. So he, uh, after a few days, he is flown to Germany to a hospital. He spends about three weeks in a coma. The German authorities announce that the result of his collapse is poisoning by this Novichok uh, agent that uh, basically shuts down your nervous system so that your body um, ceases to function. Um, and uh, he spends several times in Germany recovering. So when they first talked to him after he came out of the hospital as, as it was in, in Germany, he said that um, he was trying to learn how to do ordinary things, to speak. So he, he was uh, uh, you know, throwing a tennis ball at a wall and it proved to be a very difficult activity for him at that time. Um, so he gradually recovers um, and an investigation by two investigative agencies, the Insider and Bellingham, into how this poisoning happened um, links it's, it's very bizarre and strange. You can, in, People who hear about it for the first time, they wouldn't believe it. So they discover that uh, a team of Russian security agents, which was working in combination with scientists, chemists, from a Russian um, uh, chemical institute, um, they were following him for about three years throughout his presidential campaign. Um, and um, um, they tracked it through flight manifest through telephone billing, etc. And they identified these people who work for Russian security service. And um, the, the sort of high point of this whole investigation was when Navalny called one of these people, who one of his killers basically. He presented himself as a assistant to uh, one of the big guys uh, in Russian security services and asked him questions about what really happened and he was able in this conversation to extract information on how it has been done, that it was, uh, the poison was applied to his underwear and after that they, um, you know, got read or, or uh, laundered his uh, clothes, etc, etc. So it's very you, you can look at uh, on the YouTube, it's a very um, chilling story. Uh, one of the best investigations of, of its kind, I think, ever. Um, and um, so the, at the end of 2000, in December 2000, Russian authorities say, well, Navalny is on suspended sentence, so that there are certain parole terms that you need to observe. Uh, 
and one of them is that every two weeks you need to go to a local police station and present yourself. And he's not doing that while we don't know where he is. Well, when everybody knew, the whole world knew that he was poisoned, he was recovering in Germany, his lawyers sent, of course, the, the information about where he is to the Russian authorities, but um, it was probable that if he returns to Russia, he would be put in prison for violation of these parole terms. And um, as his friend, as, as his colleague, when he recovered, I thought it was my duty to tell him that he didn't have to return to Russia immediately. He could organize his work, you know, working from outside of Russia. But um, when I talked to him the first time after he recovered and he started writing, etc., I, I didn't even do it because it was clear that his intention was to return to Russia and it's only natural for him to do it despite all the, all the dangers. He has millions of supporters in Russia, he built his political organization there, he has done nothing wrong. The work of his life is in Russia. So in January of 2021, he bought a ticket uh, to Russia and he returns and immediately is put in prison at that time for two and a half years. So he's now serving in a prison about 200 kilometers from Moscow in quite harsh, harsh conditions. Um, he's now the most famous political prisoner. He's recognized by media. Uh, an important part of this recognition is the Sakharov Prize that was awarded by Navalny um, for his fight uh, by the EU Parliament. Um, another example of media attention is the announcement of movie about Navalny that was created by CNN and HBO, which was presented at Sundance Movie Festival recently and uh, will be available publicly later this year. And currently um, there's a new trial uh, for terrorist activities that uh, the new charges uh, that were presented against him with the um, maximum sentence of 15 years and also in a, in a cruel twist of justice you know the, the, this trial uh, is supposed to be held in Moscow uh, in a Moscow courtroom where you know the public can usually get access, media can get access. That's what happens in almost all cases. This trial will be held not in Moscow, but it will be held in the prison where uh, he is held. So the prosecutors, the judges, all the court staff will travel to Vladimir region, uh, to this colony. Um, and the reason for that is they want to limit, they say that the proceedings will be open, but, uh, you know, um, maybe it will be open to people who can break into the uh, prison and not be uh, captured. So what do we know? It's not a, a very happy moment for Russia, for the world and for um, the Russian opposition. So we, after uh, our organization has been designated extremist, um, we, it was really not safe for us and our team to remain in Russia, so we had to evacuate uh, our team and uh, we now have about 40 people working for us uh, and the main, the main uh, office is in uh, Vilnius. We continue our strategy of uh, building the political movement and building the political organization from abroad. 
Navalny remains uh, the integral part of the team. Yes, he is in prison. He is visited several times a week by his lawyer, who can uh, uh, get our messages to him, and he writes uh, messages, and uh, we um, work with him on all of our projects. So even though the, the communication really trickled to this like uh, telegram style, um, uh, we are still in contact with uh, Alexei. So what we can, what can we do from outside of Russia? We 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 are focusing on expanding our media efforts and uh, more anti-corruption work, including anti-corruption work outside of Russia uh, in Europe. And we're working on uh, a few investigations that will soon uh, show the world. I think they, they, they will be um, quite remarkable. Putin's regime is, has been a nuisance for Europe for quite some time. It may seem stable, but the problems are mounting. Uh, people are growing less and less content with, um, uh, with what's going on. The standards of living are going down. They have been going down for the last 10 years. The rule of law is non-existent. You see this uh, one example is uh, these videos of uh, tortures in Russian prisons. Um, just to give you an example, there is a case now where three teenagers are charged for, um, they played the game Minecraft online, they built a building of FSB, which is a Russian security service there online in this virtual world, and uh, they wanted to blow it up. Uh, the, they are detained. They were 14 when they did it, they now 16. So they have been in detention for this time. And uh, the prosecutor is asking for this virtual crime, if it's a crime at all, um, from six to nine years in prison. So that's the, the extent of cruelty and injustice about what's going on in, in Russia. Um, and of course people know about this and, and, and people are not uh, happy. So I, I don't talk in sort of time frames when things will change in Russia. But obviously this discontent uh, sooner or later will result in a crisis and uh, inevitably change will come in Russia and uh, we hope to be uh, a force that is, um, is helping Russia to shape future Russia for the better. Thank you. Maybe it was too long, but uh, I could talk for hours about this and now I'm happy to answer your questions. And maybe the last uh, slide. Um, with the inevitable care. Thank you very much for sharing your experience and uh, sharing the experience of Mr. Navalny and giving us an insight. Um, and indeed, it is very important to take uh, those democratic values uh, not for granted. And this is a very important message, I believe, for uh, not only use um, here in Latvia, but in Europe, taking in account tendencies uh, of uh, support uh, towards uh, your, uh, democratic values. And here we see clear example how people are ready to pay their lives for such a, uh, high dreams and high values. Uh, and there are many questions regarding this. I tried to put them in the groups. Uh, and uh, the first group of questions are regarded to uh, social media. And for example, Paul Spences is asking, seeing the constant limitations for social media networks and internet overall in Russia, now even including the partial uh, cooperation with, uh, from big tech companies, uh, how the increasing regulations and restrictions of the usage of internet are influencing the opposition movement 
and what are the ways to avoid these restrictions uh, and then advance the role of opposition movement through the internet. And uh, another question so were regarded uh, again social media in a way is is the social media campaign the way how to uh, to move towards uh, democracy in Russia? Um, indeed, social media became. Uh, the most important communication channel for us with our supporters and with the public. Um, Twitter, YouTube in particular, um, Facebook, Vkontakte. Um, it's not black and white in terms of restrictions of internet and social media. Most social media are free. Uh, the internet um, is uh, the Russian government put in place a system that would allow it to block internet content, but you can now still watch internet videos. It's unclear whether this situation will continue. It probably will not. Um, when we had uh, these uh, uh, elections, uh, parliamentary elections in September of last year, um, government forced Apple and Google to remove our application um, uh, for smart voting from their app stores. Um, there are always cases that people are prosecuted for reposts uh, and likes of content that the authorities deem offensive. They have been blocking Telegram uh, Messenger which is used to um, for, uh, as a media outlet, as independent media for uh, many bloggers and activists in Russia. They were trying it for a few years. They were not very successful. Uh, now it's again, again allowed. It's possible that uh, they may ban uh, YouTube. They are preparing an alternative, Russian-based alternative to the international social media networks. Um, we try to uh, use the resources that we have at any particular time. So while we can, we'll use whatever means are available now uh, in terms of social media. When the restrictions increase, will surely think of something else and maybe leaflets etc will return to the 19th century campaigning. Thank you. Another group of questions are regarded about future president. So uh, one of the questions is uh, if uh, even if the presidential elections were legitimate, legitimate do you think Navalny could realistically come the first after Putin? Putin is still uh, popular uh, uh, in the polls. And the other questions also were related to, to, to moods uh, in the publics. Uh, so um, taking in account uh, that there is the still uh, the support towards Putin still. Um, do you have clear road image of those who don't like uh, your organization fr uh, from, from, from the society part. Um, in a country like Russia, which is uh, you know an authoritarian regime, it's really difficult to trust whatever opinion polls are presented. Um, people are afraid to speak what they really think. Um, and um, uh, the polling organizations in many cases are influenced by the state. It's a documented fact in Russia. So the levels of support that we see for Putin personally, for the Russian authorities, I would not take it at face value. Uh, one example of how independent candidate can um, participate in elections is what we talked about today, the mayoral elections of Moscow. Independent candidate, no money, no resources, um, 
against a mayor with unlimited uh, finances, with all access to state media, with the, you know, people in Russia and all over the world that trust the person who is already in the position because supposedly he knows what, uh, what he's uh, doing. Uh, Navalny got almost to a runoff tour, so he got 27% in a short campaign that we were able to put together. So if the uh, situation changes in Russia, if elections are free um, and fair and independent candidates can run, uh, an independent candidate can easily uh, take on Putin who has a certain level of support but people are quite disillusioned. Look at the latest incident when the leader of Chechnya, uh, Kadyrov and his um, friends are openly calling for beheading of a Russian citizen for just expressing some him and his family for, for just expressing uh, his views on the internet and the Russian authorities Putin included don't do anything about that how do you think people uh, feel about that there is no rule of law there is no um, economic prosperity the economic inequality is uh, Russia is, is one of the most unequal countries, so Russia has produced uh, many billionaires, but people in the regions, the teachers and doctors, nurses, uh, the average salary is less than uh, 400 euros per month. Would you vote for a leader that has presided over um, you know, and Russia is a rich country, it can afford its people to live much better. So I, I think an uh, independent candidate would be, uh, would uh, be able of course to uh, run against Putin and uh, at this time Navalny, he has earned his place to be this candidate and uh, I hope we will see an election when um, where he's a participant. Thank you very much. Uh, another group of, of questions goes uh, towards uh, opposition itself. Uh, and uh, for example, Artur is asking what are the matters in which the opposition forces is Rus in Russia disagree upon among themselves? Is there anything preventing further consolidation of the opposition? And uh, another question uh, came. Uh, uh, from Robert, who, who wrote that for research purposes, he often follows uh, Russian media space, both propaganda of power and the views of opposition. And following various opposition channels on the YouTube platform, he noticed that opposition is divided uh, despite the similar view. And on YouTube channels, Novosti, Sverjavi, Khoitsit, Malchats, etc. Uh, FBK was criticized uh, for not uh, being able to act harder. Uh, what is being done to bring together these different generally opposition-minded audiences? Um, several comments. First of all, it's natural for people to have different opinions. It's a fact of democratic system. Um, it's... Um, um, I know a little bit about Latvian political system, but you have many parties, always new parties are created, people always argue about things. Of course, in Russia, people would argue uh, about how Russia would be governed and what should be the tactic to remove this uh, autocratic rule. Uh, it's only uh, natural, and people have different personalities. Uh, it's uh, quite tough environment, so of course people would uh, argue about what uh, to do, etc, etc. There have been a number of attempts at uniting um, few uh, opposition figures that have following in Russia. We have actively participated in them and we're open to talk with uh, 
our colleagues. Uh, but if you try to manage a complex thing by a committee with people, it's very difficult to achieve something. So we created an organization with clear leadership, uh, with clear goals, and uh, with transparent governance uh, and uh, fun, fun finances. And that's why we were able to um, achieve something in you know, raising awareness of what we stand for in participating in political events, etc. So sometimes you need to unite, but sometimes you need leadership. And in Russia, there's a little incentive for people to unite. In a normal democratic system, okay, you, one leader has certain following, another one also individually they don't get enough to get over the threshold to be in the parliament so they create a block and it's it's an incentive for them to get together to combine their supporters so that they can achieve some electoral result in russia where unfortunately the results of the elections uh, are decided in kremlin there's little incentive for people to unite because they are unsure that even if they uh, unite their supporters, they will get to parliament on, or, or get uh, success in the elections. Once political system becomes more liberal, once it becomes fair, of course people, like-minded people, uh, would uh, come together and will see consolidation uh, among people who stand for democracy in Russia. Thank you very much. And from this actually comes another group of questions. Uh, and this is regarded to EU and uh, Russia's relations with the EU. Now we see um, that uh, those, uh, those relations are in crisis for sure and, uh, and uh, no one knows how it will go, uh, uh, but it will be a result of um, Ukrainian crisis. But uh, if we look in, uh, in the future, and what students are asking is, uh, we saw in Belarus that opposition was not asking for joining the EU. They were asking simply to, to get rid of authoritarian regime and to become democratic. So how do you see the, the, this uh, future demand from opposition uh, in Russia? Uh, is there any views uh, to join the EU or to, to create other models of creation uh, of uh, relations with EU in, a, in the future? Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, as I said in my speech, Russia really belongs to Europe culturally and in many other ways. Um, EU is larger than European Union. European Union is a certain political structure uh, which has its own history, which is in a certain situation uh, and uh, it's a combination of 27 countries. It's not easy to, 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 to govern, to agree uh, between 27, 27 uh, different members. So um, it is not a uh, prospect of uh, a few years when um, countries of the former Soviet Union, Ukraine, Belarus after change comes there, Russia especially because it's so big, that they would that the issue of them even starting to prepare to join EU would be on the agenda. The EU is also, um, it's not a, an easy decision to invite, uh, let alone Russia, but Ukraine with its 40 million people. It's very difficult to integrate. You know, um, the, the newly, the new EU members, including Latvia, in the beginning of 21st century, got into EU and they received uh, quite large subsidies to um, 
increase the level of infrastructure and public services in these new countries. But think about integrating Ukraine into EU in this, um, in this um, uh, manner. Would voters in Paris, Milan and Riga vote for uh, subsidizing these new members? Uh, this is uh, a difficult situation. Yes, if democratic um, forces come to power in Russia, in Belarus, there will be natural movements towards EU, towards integrating into European structures, but it probably will be decades before EU, an issue of some uh, of an ascension to EU will be really on the agenda. Let's hope that the EU will be still there, taking account of the visions of the European Union itself. Apart from Britain leaving, which is kind of sad, but the level of support for EU uh, has been increasing over the last few years, and uh, it's a, I think it's a, it's a big success, um, which created enormous benefits for all members, economic, political, peace and stability. Of course there are problems when 27 people try to think about uh, something in common, but uh, it has definitely been a, a big success and uh, all the uh, citizens of EU, I think, realize it. Uh -huh. And then there is a question regarding citizens of EU exactly. Uh, so, uh, how can EU citizens, uh, use in EU, help your movement to be heard? And notably, use in Russia activists who have voice, but unfortunately, it's enough. So, is there any way to support? And uh, and, and also regarding this support, uh, there was a question regarding Sakharov Prize. Uh, what does it mean for your organization? <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, when we're dealing with uh, Russia and Putin, there is no easy way of changing the situation. Uh, it's bad. It's bad for people in Russia. It's spilling over its borders into um, its near neighbors. Ukraine is an obvious example. Um, the refugees that Belarusia, with support of, of Putin, brought from Middle East that are spilling into Poland, into Latvia. Um, uh, it's um, even, you know, tens of thousands of kilometers away in the US, Russia is conducting cyber operations that influence presidential elections, that influence big infrastructure company. Um, there is no silver bullet. There is no set of measures that some genius can work out that everybody would do to um, make Russia a responsible part of international community. It will happen. History teaches us that change um, is the only constant in the world history, but nobody knows the exact scenario time frames. Um, what people in the West can do um, change in Russia will come from people in Russia. They will be the main driving factor and it will be a result of certain natural historic processes that happened in different countries throughout centuries and eventually will happen in Russia. I think the most important for people in the EU is to strengthen their own institutions, to be together, to, um, for instance, root out corrupt money that comes into its system from Russia, from other countries. Um, you probably know of scandals that happen every year in different European countries that politicians take money uh, from foreign influences and corruption is a big problem and it's something that people, if you, if you work on it consistently, it will be eradicated. 
um, value the freedoms that you get. Don't take them for, for granted. Uh, there's something that people in other countries fight for. Um, in, in terms of Russia, just uh, um, don't forget, don't forget Alexei Navalny, don't forget that people are suffering in, in other countries, uh, in your neighbors. Um, if there are people who have to leave Russia, support them. Lithuania has been really welcoming to Russian opposition activists uh, um, that uh, it's um, uh, you can get legal status there, you, you can get uh, some uh, support um, and uh, just uh, overall compassion. But most importantly, strengthen your own institution, uh, police your own territory. Um, have a united front against um, hostile uh, opponents like Putin, Lukashenko, etc. Thank you very much. And then there are a couple of uh, particular questions regarding internal um, movements in Russia. So the first thing is lots of people from Russian opposition are skeptical about the political party Yabloko. Uh, why it is not truly really possible to consider it as an opposition party. And a uh, similar question went towards Medusa, uh, which is uh, located here in uh, Riga. There are also certain doubts uh, regarding their uh, like true intentions or their financing uh, sources. So uh, what is your opinion regarding these two actors? Uh, Yavlaka is probably the, the only, is the only sort of democratically oriented party that registered in Russia. Um, it has many good people, it has many activists, because, you know, if, if you are interested in politics, you, um, you probably want to be part of some formal organization. And Yamloka is, is the only one like that. Um, we may have had differences with the um, leadership of Yamloka. So Navalny was a member of Yamloka in up until 2000, maybe seven. So he was the deputy uh, leader of the Moscow branch of Yamloka. Um, he was expelled because he was too active and he, wa he was too innovative and uh, uh, unorthodox in his approach. And, um, you know, he went out and he built a movement that is many times more than Yabloka, which is a recognized political party with a certain history. Um, uh, and uh, with, uh, uh, you know, a consistent, maybe small, but consistent number of supporters. We may have slight ideological differences, but the main thing is that they don't really get any results. Uh, they got less than 2% votes in the latest parliamentary elections. So what counts is really the um, the public recognition, the, the votes, what you can create. Um, I'm not even talking about the remarks of uh, Mr. Yelinsky, the, the head of Yabloka about Navalny, where he often, people say that the main enemy for him is not uh, Putin, but Navalny, but that really doesn't matter. If they would be successful and they, if they would be able to formulate the message that would resonate with, um, uh, with Russians, if they would be able to get into the parliament, um, they could be effective because ideologically uh, we are not that different. There has been efforts by young activists to get into Yavok and to try to change it from within because 
Mr. Yevlinsky and a few of his close colleagues have been um, at the helm of Yablokov for probably over 25 years. No significant result, so let's bring some new blood, but uh, they have consistently resisted this change, so that's basically the, the situation. We would like to work with, uh, with uh, Yablok, we would like to be in a partnership with a recognized political party, but um, um, unfortunately for this reason it's not happening. And regarding Medusa? <clears throat> Medusa was one of the first independent news outlets in Russian language. Uh, created by a team of very experienced media professionals. Um, it gained a lot of traction. Um, it is independent reporting. These are stories that most liberally minded Russians read. Um, I read it, uh, th th these stories, <clears throat> that they put out. I support it when they were designated foreign agents last year. Uh, it's a, an important news outlet. I don't agree with everything that they write, but it's, a, it's an important pillar of independent journalism in Russia. Um, sources of financing, if they put out good product, uh, I, I don't blame them that they may not be that transparent because in Russian environment with uh, the Russian security services and authorities trying to put pressure on all independent voices, it, they made choice to be not transparent, we made make the choice to be, more, uh, to be more transparent, they are less transparent about their financing sources. It's, uh, I don't blame them for this. It's a tough environment. Thank you very much. And uh, since our time is running out, the final question is regarding the, to yourself and Mr. Navalny. And uh, students are really worrying about your uh, security and how secure or safe you feel. Uh, and regarding Mr. Navalny and his future, uh, when he will come out of prison, so uh, what would be the next steps and what would be uh, the, those steps before he comes out from prison from your side? So we've seen a number of assassinations of enemies of Russian state by Russian security s um, services over the last 15 years, the most prominent Let's list them. Alexander Litvinenko in 2007, um, Boris Nemtsov 2015, um, Skripals, which was the first sort of poisoning by Russian security services in Britain, major European country, with a chemical weapon that is banned by all international conventions. That's something unprecedented. Uh, Navalny, uh, obviously. So Russian security services are able to, if, if they are given a target, I think they can conduct operations of this kind in any part of the world. Um, if you think about this danger that, uh, that uh, you are as a, as a Russian political activist, it's really hard to live your life uh, normally. Um, so I try to make reasonable precautions, but I, I try not to really think about it. Um, more importantly, the issue of Navalny's health and security. You know, uh, he was on a hunger strike for um, several weeks um, after the, in the first months that he got.